Happy Monday, everyone. Welcome to our meeting. I'm Minelia, one of the Monday meetings director. Hi, I'm, my name is Octong. I am the second director meeting and welcome you guys today for our technical meeting with the Becker Tilly. Before we get started, here are the announcements for the week. Please join us next Monday, October 25th. We will have Q&A with AA executives about their internship experience. Wednesday, October 27, the Anderson Tax will present on how to effectively adapt to a remote working environment. And on October 29, we have a Halloween scavenger hunt, Hopkin decoration. We encourage everyone to have their cameras on and please wait until the end to ask questions with the raise hand feature on Zoom. Without further ado, please feel free to take it away. Okay, right now we have Garrett from Bacadilly. He will present on the high performance in the workplace. So Garrett, it's yours. Yeah, Dick Tuan, thank you. Good to see you again. Uh, Ninella, Good to see thank you. you. You as well. Um, yeah, so hi everybody. My name is Garrett. I'm a campus recruiting manager with Baker Tilly. Um, before we get started in the chat, I'm going to put just a registration link. This is so we can steal all of your personal information and sell it on the black market. No, I'm kidding. It should just ask for your name and email address, guys. Uh, then it'll send you a follow-up email. If you've already set up a profile with Baker Tilly, you're all good. You're set. You don't have to do anything else. If you haven't, if you're new to the firm, if this is your first time with us today, um, it'll ask you to fill out kind of a longer form that allows you to express some of your interests in the different areas. But yes, um, so let me then, the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put my email address in the chat here. Okay, there you go. I spelled everything right there. And then if I can, I'm going to do a little bit of a share screen here. There we go. All right, can I get just a little thumbs up? Can everyone see the screen okay? Okay. Um, so high performance in the workplace, requisite skills for success, like all of that kind of stuff. Um, let's see, I'll give it a second for the thumbs up to go away. But um, how many of you guys have already landed positions with firms, either internships or full-time positions or anything like that? Okay, Henry, yep. Dr. Juan, good for you, yep. Mariana, good for you. Christine, good for you, yep. Okay, awesome. Um, so regardless of whether you're you're aiming to work at Baker Tilly or another firm like this should help. Okay, Justin, love the shades, looks awesome. Um, this is gonna be like, a, what I'm gonna share with you guys today, none of it is gonna be, um, like you're gonna look at it and you're gonna be like, none of it's gonna be new stuff. None of it's gonna be like, oh my God, I had no idea about that. For those of you who are still looking for positions with firms, this will kind of help you zero in on what firms are looking for but it's also what will make you very successful once you're in the workplace, okay? First, for those of you who are not familiar with Baker Tilly, really quick, it's a big firm, um, headquartered in Chicago, founded in Wisconsin in 1931. Um, we recently crossed these numbers that you see on the right-hand side. Uh, we recently crossed the $1 billion in revenue threshold we recently crossed the 5,000 team members threshold, okay? Baker Tilly US is also part of Baker Tilly International. So that's a $4 billion a year in revenue, uh, global network of over 120 firms. So you'll see like a Baker Tilly China, which is part of our network, but not actually the same firm as Baker Tilly US. We're both part of Baker Tilly International, but separate firms, that make sense? I encourage you guys, if you're interested to learn more about the firm, just take a look at our website. There's, it's a really deep, big website with a lot of different stuff on there. I'm always surprised what students end up finding there because a lot of it's stuff I still haven't seen yet. So that's just a little bit about the firm, but let's dive into what I wanted to share with you guys today. So here's the agenda, the roadmap of what we're gonna cover today. And do me a huge favor, guys. If any of you have questions, just take yourself off of mute and ask me. Is that okay? Like if you type it in the, um, let's see, Gemma, can you do me a favor? If you see in the chat, if anyone asks questions, can you just pot, like interrupt me and say, hey, there's a question in the chat. I know it's like a blinking orange light, but I'm not going to see it because I'm just going to be in kind of presentation mode. Is that sure okay? thing. You do that? Yes, I'll read it out. Cool. So yeah, if you guys have any questions, please just take yourself off of mute and ask. But if you do end up putting a question in the chat, Gemma, you can help us out there. So 
here's our roadmap. This is kind of requisite skills versus, we always see this a lot, right? How many of you guys have seen prerequisites for classes? Like you have to take this class before you take another versus, hey, requisite. Once you get there, what do you need, right? The first one that we're going to talk about is problem solving. Then we're going to move into leadership, time management, self-reliance, customer service, and communication skills. When you guys look at this list, is there anything on here where you're like, oh, I didn't know that firms want people that have time management skills? Is there any skill on here where you guys are like, oh my God, I had no idea you guys are looking for that? No, right? That's sort of the whole point here is that like what we're going to talk about today, none of this is, is, you know, revelation or none of this is new information. It's a lot of stuff that we're going to go through that I'm going to give you little examples that it's really easy to say it, right? It's really easy to put this in a job posting and say, here's what we're looking for. But for any of you who ever worked part-time jobs, you'll know just how difficult some of these things are. For example, anyone here ever worked in uh, restaurants or, or retail? Throw our hands, anyone? Okay, right? So you will know just how hard customer service sometimes can be. Right, so it's easy to say we want people that have good customer service skills. It's a different thing when you're encountered with difficulties in real life to practice that. So that's kind of the theme of what we're going to talk about today. So first of all, requisite, just needed for a particular purpose, right? Not before, but needed for the purpose. Now, prerequisite to accounting, these are kind of the same things, but I just wanted to make a distinction before. So for those of you who have secured positions, congratulations, but now what? Right, so that's kind of the thing here. I'm trying to, what I wanted to do today was make this less of a recruiting thing for Baker Tilly and more of a uh, informational session for all of you that end up, whether it's in public accounting or any other role in life that you guys find yourselves, whether it's with Baker Tilly or not, I wanted to do something that would help, okay? So remember, whatever firm you join, wherever you go in this business, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is provide solutions for our clients. I love how like generic and boring that says like, um, you know, uh, Ninella, what do you do for a living? Oh, I provide solutions for my clients. It's like, that's, that's great. I, I don't actually know what you do. It's just that like, right. Every company that you ever work for is trying to provide solutions for their clients, but that's more so in a service industry, right? So I don't want you to think of yourselves as tax associates or tax interns or audit associates or audit interns, your business people that are trying to help people solve their problems and your skill set for doing so happens to be through accounting. But trust me, if somebody asks you, you know, hey, Alexandra, can you help me with this problem? You're not going to go like, oh, whoa, 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 I only do one thing, sorry. Right? So I want you guys to think about your own experiences in life, whether it was with school or a part-time job or a full-time job. But I want you to think about two things. I want you to think about how annoying it was to work with someone who all they did was point out problems. That won't work, that's wrong, that's off, that's bad, but they never offer a solution. It's really frustrating to work with people who don't offer solutions to problems. They just point out all the things that's wrong. Like we can do that, right? But if you don't, the hard step is the solution, right? Now, I also want you guys to remember in your own experiences, maybe you've been the person that only pointed out what was wrong. Maybe you were the person that said bad, wrong, bad, won't work, dumb idea, right? I want you to think about also the times where you were able to, all, you were able to come to the table with a solution. Anyone have any examples or stories of this for yourselves where you were able to be a little more solution oriented than just point out a problem? Or maybe you've worked with a coworker who all they did was say wrong, 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 wrong. Anyone? Well, I had an instance with my coworker where she was the head server yeah. and, you know, she would be critical about everyone's work, but when she does something wrong, we can't say anything. <laughs> so just remember that, like this, this exists out there. All right. Yeah. Let's talk about leadership for a second. So, this is a very common interview question, both for Baker Tilly and for other firms. How many of you have been asked about leadership in an interview before? Yep, Justin, yep. 
Gemma? Yep. Okay. So pro tip here. When you're answering a question about leadership, this answer had better be about other people. Your answer had better include how what you did made other people good at what they do, right? Let me give you a very common example that we hear, hear a lot. Um, I was in my, uh, my, my, um, my managerial accounting class. Uh, we had a group project that was assigned to us and my teammates, well, one of them was okay. One of them just never showed up for things and the other one just wasn't very good or wasn't very smart and just quiet and they didn't contribute to anything. So we assigned all the parts and nobody did their parts. So at the last minute I did everything and it came together and then we got an A on the project. And so that was good leadership skills. That's probably about the worst answer you could give for a leadership question. It's not about what you did to achieve something. It's about how you impact and affect other people and make them good at what they do. Does that make sense, guys? Do not fall into this trap that firms will lay for you and happily watch you walk into, right? Now, once you get to your job and you get to a firm, your ability to make the people around you better is that's leadership. Now, let me, let me suggest something minor that ends up being a really big deal. As an intern or a first year associate, you may feel that you don't have many leadership opportunities. That's true. You won't have a ton of opportunities, but there will be a few in there. And it may not feel like a big deal, but your good attitude and your energy and your aura and everything about like, if you have a positive attitude and people wanna be around you, that's good leadership. That's a great way of expressing leadership at a point in which your technical knowledge is probably fairly limited, at least initially. Once we build the technical knowledge and we build the reputation and all of that, then the rest of it follows. So initially what's really under your control is your effort and your attitude. If you're the kind of person that people want to be around, that's really good. If you're the kind of person that no one wants to be around because you're an asshole or you're not fun to work with, or you never take anything seriously and everything's a joke and you don't do anything, guess what? You're gonna have a lot of lunches alone, right? Early on, a really good way to affect leadership or to affect things is to have these good leadership skills, to, to be someone that's positive, that rubs off on people. So when you enter the room, people all of a sudden are happier. They feel looser. They feel you know, energetic. They feel great now that you know, uh, Daquan is here, right? Like, okay, awesome. Like, it's great. We're going to have a great day now. Like, that's something under your control that you can influence on day one. Does anyone have any questions about anything so far? I have a question a little bit. It's like, I don't know how to describe this. It's like, okay, so you want people to like, to like you, right? So then you want to be like easygoing and stuff like that. But people tend to like, I guess, take that as like a, uh, oh, I could be relaxed. Like I'm gonna slack up a little bit because I know this guy, you know, I go with him, I, he's nice with me, our buddy buddy. So I'm gonna slack up a little bit like with my job. Like, how do you like tell that person like, hey, I know like we're friends and stuff like that, but you, you know, we have to get stuff done like to establish like respect. Oh, you don't, as a first or second year, you absolutely a hundred percent should not be saying that to anyone, Dixon. <laughs> okay. One of the best ways you can lead early on is through example. Now, fortunately, there's tons and tons and tons of evidence that suggests that human beings learn by example, especially young people. Right? Maybe not old people as much. They're old. They're 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 gone. Right? But the example that you set mm -hmm. ends up doing that. And I always, uh, my wife and I laugh about it. We we joke about this because um, my wife is an elementary school PE teacher. Her undergraduate degree is in philosophy from UCLA, and she has a master's in public health from the University of Arizona. Um, she's a very qualified person that chose with her life to teach children because she thinks that's a very critically important thing um, to contribute to society. She takes her job extraordinarily seriously, and yet it includes playing dodgeball with children at the age of like six or seven. See what I'm saying, Dixon? Like, you can take your job seriously and still laugh, smile, be lighthearted and have fun. That it isn't mutually exclusive that because I like to take my job seriously, I need to frown and scowl all the time to show you that I'm serious. Like, oh, I, I don't laugh. I just, I just do work. I'm serious, right? Like you can be easy going while still getting a ton of work done. And yeah, you're right. I would not suggest in your first or second year to tell people that they need to focus more on work. 
there are ways where you can kind of say like, Hey, like you can focus on your own work. You can move, you can, you know, like there are different ways of doing that. But the idea is still like being, you can still smile. You can still laugh. You can still be kind. You should never get upset with anyone. Right. But that's right. one way I would suggest like setting a tone early on when you're working, where like you're getting stuff done, right. You're able to know when you've crossed a line of I've been talking about the baseball game now for a half an hour and we need to do work. Right. Right. Does that help a little bit? Yeah, it helps. Good. Very good question though. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Before we move on, anyone else? All right. Let's do it. Ooh. How many of you guys like making to-do lists? While I'm making to-do lists. Sometimes when I'm guilty pleasure of mine is to spend more time on the actual to-do list itself than the items on the to-do list. But that's, you know, that happens for all of us, right? Henry, yeah, your to-do list guy. All right, love it. So I highly recommend that you guys do this when you show up at CPA firms. And the reason why, has anyone here done an internship yet? No one? Yes. Henry, you have? Mm-hmm. Okay. Were, were you ever asked to do by either multiple people or sometimes by one person, were you ever assigned like three or four tasks at the same time? Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, what, give me, was it, was it one person with multiple or was it multiple people with like one or two each? Um, it was like multiple people with like one or two. Yeah. Okay. And Henry, each one of them was like, Hey, this is pretty important. Uh, no rush, but could you get it to me by the end of today? Yep. Right. So now, now you go back to your desk and you're like, Hmm. Yeah. Hi. I've got a lot of stuff to do and I don't really know. All of them said this was really important and I don't know which one to start with. And by the way, Henry, did you ever go ask someone, uh, hey, do you have any work for me? And they gave you work and you didn't write it down and you got back to your desk and you're like, wait, what did Scott ask me to do? Um, a little bit just because it, it got complicated. And then I was like, can you show me how to do it again? <laughs> yep, 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 yep. So this is where making your to-do lists really help. Bring a notepad with you to every meeting that you go to. Even if it's Zoom meetings, write stuff down. Ask to clarify things that you don't understand initially. Because Henry, your experience a lot of times with people where they get frustrated is when you keep coming back to them. Hey, can you do this again? Can you, hey, can you show this to me again? Whereas if you'd done that up front, it wouldn't have bothered them as much. But when you wait, like hey, a few hours later and you go back, hey, can you show me this to me again? They're like, I don't even remember what I told you in the first place, but yeah, let's go back and do it. Yeah. That's that sound familiar? Yes. Okay. So the to-do list really help. All right. Now, early on in your careers as interns or associates, prioritizing things is really difficult and you won't have a good feel for what, do you guys remember, have, have you had any professors that were like, this is the most important class you're going to take. If you think this is an easy A, you should just drop this class now because this is actually difficult. Do you remember the first time you heard that and you took it seriously and you're like, oh God, yeah, oh my God. That, like, okay, yeah, this is serious. But then as you all started moving through CSUN and you started becoming sophomores and juniors and seniors, didn't you start to get a better feel for which professors were like, they just say that to everyone no matter what. And then there were absolutely some professors who was like, no, they're serious. Like this is, this is definitely not an easy class. Does that make sense okay. to you guys? You start to get a better feel for that the longer you work in an accounting firm where some senior associates and managers that you work for, it's the world is on fire. This needs to be done right now. Oh my God, if this doesn't get done, we're all screwed and we're all going to be homeless looking for a job. And you'll find that some people, it's very serious. The deadline really is today. And other people, that's just, that's what they do. But early on, gosh, Henry, it's pretty difficult to know that, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things you can cheat on early on in your career for at least your first or second year while you're getting a feel for your colleagues and your bosses is you write down your to-do list and you ask them, if, if one person has assigned you multiple tasks, hey, I know, uh, you know, Scott, you've assigned me four things. Can you help? Which one should I focus on first and which one can I focus on last? Henry, in your situation where you have multiple people doing it, Sometimes you can ask them like, hey, just by the way, like I've been assigned from multiple different people, multiple different things. 
like which which one would you like i know i want to get the stuff done for you but is there a price like when is this due collect the due dates for all of them collect how much and ask each one of them hey how much time do you think this task should take me and then you start kind of moving the things around to get an idea for what needs to be done immediately and which task is going to take a long time yeah that's basically what i ended up doing like we had a like a group meeting Yep. with the whole team so yeah yep. they told me which one to prioritize yeah and henry that's not that's not easy by the way that's like i know i know this is simple to say but to actually do this requires strong communication skills it requires you to write down the right stuff how many of us studying for classes or with jobs you write notes when someone tells you what to do you get back to your desk and you look at it and you're just like i this isn't important i don't need this right? Okay. So this is time. This is what helps with time management, making these to-do lists, preparing for meetings and getting ready, right? This kind of stuff, it's small, but it helps big time. It'll help you stay sane, by the way. Cause if you say you ever, you guys ever been to a restaurant where somebody takes your order and they don't write it down? It always makes me uncomfortable because I know if it was me, I would forget and meet, you know, when someone, hi, nice to meet you. I'm Gary. It just goes in one ear, right out the other. I'm just like, I just met this guy. What's his name? Like that happens to all of us. So if you don't write stuff down, you're not going to remember. Right. Self-reliance. So this is one of my favorite slides in the deck. And the reason why guys is that self-reliance, there are two parts to this. Here's the more obvious one, right? Self-reliance means relying on yourself. It means that you've got to think through things and try to research solutions to problems before you come to, you know, if, if I come to, to Mariana and say, hey, um, can you help me with this? And she goes, well, did you try to come up with an answer first yourself? And I go, oh, no, I just need an answer from you. That's not really learning, is it? That's Mariana just doing it for me, right? If I come up with some solutions and I come to Mariana and I say, hey, I've got a problem, but I think this is what the solutions are. She can go, oh, okay, yes, that's correct. You're on the right track, good job. Or she can go, hey, you know what? I see what you're thinking there. No, actually, that's not the right path. Here's the right path, try this instead. If you come to someone with a solution to a problem, but just like I said at the open, even if you're wrong, it's nice that somebody, that you've thought about it and you've tried it, you've tried something, and now we're gonna course correct a little bit. This is easier to work with than somebody that comes to you and goes, Hey, Abigail, sorry, uh, how do I do this? Can you just do it for me? Right? So this is part one of self-reliance. This is the part that we recognize and make sense. Here's the funny part to me. Part two of self-reliance is knowing when you don't need to rely on yourself. Right? Go for help when something is unfamiliar and doesn't look right to you. Guess what? It might not be. Right? Nicole, maybe you've been assigned a task and you spend five hours working on it and you come back to uh, Jeanette and you say, hey, Jeanette, um, uh, I don't know how to do this. It, it, it's, took, it's taken me five hours to do it. And she goes, oh my God, Nicole, this should have taken you one hour. Why didn't you come to me sooner when you didn't know how to do this? Yes, that absolutely did happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's tricky though, right? Because we're telling you, hey, I know the feeling too, Nicole. It's, hey, I'm smart, I can figure this out on my own. I need to prove to them that I can figure this out on my own and that I'm not somebody that's whiny that's just gonna come to you for, I don't know how to do this, please help me, right? Yes, or having on your shoulder, like they expect me to know this. So I should yeah. be able to know this and figure it out. And when you can, you're like, oh my God. This is a dumb question. I should know this and I don't wanna ask it because it's going to reveal to everyone just how dumb I am. I'm not gonna ask. Right. <laughs> so- this, guys, admittedly, this is very tricky. This is very difficult and it takes trial and error to feel out when you should go for help versus when you should do something on your own. You guys, by the way, this problem doesn't go away even when you're like a manager or a partner. This is very difficult. But early on, if you start creating good habits for it, you'll be able to handle, you'll start learning and feeling better on how to do this. And it goes back to the, hey, uh, you know, Nicole, how long should this take me? This should take you two hours. Okay, so if I'm still like banging my head against a wall in two hours, I should come ask you, right? Yep, thank you. Or it's like, hey, I tried to do this, but it's not working. And your manager looks at it and goes, oh my God, this is like, that's not your fault. They didn't give us what we need to complete this problem, you know, this the problem. 
you may not have known that, right? So like, this is a place where, and this is tricky again, guys, two parts, one where you're doing this on your own, one where you're asking for help. Any questions so far? I saw some orange blinking lights, but uh, any anything that I can help clarify here? Do you guys have any questions? That is mostly common saying that happened to me and yep. that happened to okay. me too. <laughs> Thanks, Gemma. Yeah, I mean, look, guys, this doesn't like, this doesn't go away even once you, I've, I've been with this firm for, this is my eighth year with the firm now. This kind of stuff happens to me on a daily basis, right? So it's much better in your first couple of years to ask these kind of questions. And like, if you have a partner coming to you asking these questions, like at a manager or partner level, you're kind of expected to know this stuff. At an intern or first and second year associate level, you've got a lot more room for grace to be able to ask these sort of things. And it, it is tricky. You've got to, you've got to figure it out to, you know, you feel it out to see what works and what doesn't work for you and your, your colleagues. I know this one's a little counterintuitive, but I, I wanted to put it in there so that you guys know part of the good thing of working for a CPA firm, whoever it may be, is that there are a lot of people that are really smart there and they can help you. Maybe it, maybe you just weren't looking at something right and you ask a colleague, a friend of yours that's maybe the same level or a year above you, they look at it and go, oh, try looking at it from this angle. You do that and you're like, oh yeah, that was easy. It's like better to do that early on than five hours later. Right? All right, let's talk about customer service a little bit. Um, understanding what your client does and what they need is very important, right? Anyone here worked in restaurants? Emma, yes. Anyone else? That's Juan. Dr. Juan, what did you do at the restaurant? So I do the server, taking all the print food, uh, recommend food, recommendation right. on the daily basis. <laughs> right. So if you were bad at recommending food, like, hey, try this, like, this was awful. Or like somebody, asks for a soup and you go, ah, I wouldn't get that soup. I'd get a different soup, right? Understanding what they want. And I know for food, it seems very simple and it is to a certain degree, right? But for a server at a restaurant, your job is to understand what they need at all times. Maybe it's food or maybe it's drink, maybe it's bread, maybe it's rice, maybe it's whatever it is, right? But you have to understand what they need in order to help them. If you don't understand in a business setting what your client's needs are outside of audited financial statements and uh, tax returns, you're going to be in trouble. You need to know the nuances of their business, right? So part of this in delivering excellent customer service, being responsive to requests. Now, my sincerest apologies if any of you have emailed me and I've taken uh, my sweet time in getting back to you. But it's annoying when you email someone and it takes them a week to get back to you, isn't it? How much better do you feel when they answer you within an hour? or within 10 minutes. Oh God, great. I instantly had an answer to that question. By the way, you can be that the other way around. When you are the person that is really fast to respond to things, you are now, you know, you have the power to make them feel really great about it. Even if it spurs a longer conversation that are upset with the content of what you're saying, at least you're, you're, you're responding. You're putting them in a more important place. By ignoring and waiting days to email someone back, you are telling them they are not very important to you or you just don't want to answer the question, right? This can be you guys, be responsive to requests, send industry related or other relevant information first in mind. This will happen not as much in an internship or in your first year, maybe even your second year. As you start to promote, you'll start to get to know your clients better. You've at least seen them for two consecutive years. You know their name, you know what they look like, you know if they're married and if they have kids, right? you know what they like about their job and what they don't like about their job. So then it, it gets fun where like, maybe you see something, you see an article on the internet, you email it to the controller and say, hey, this reminded me a lot of your company. I wanted to say, have you read this article yet? I think, it, I think you might find it interesting. That's how you start to build relationships with your clients, but it also lets them know that you're paying attention and that you care. That's great customer service. Be prepared and prompt for meetings. Of course, nobody likes the person who shows up for a meeting and is like, oh, hang on a second, give me a couple minutes, I need to find this, okay, now this, okay, the file still isn't loading right, like, you got to have that stuff ready to go. Lastly, the can-do-will-do attitude, we talked about this a lot, but 
whether it's internally with colleagues and leadership abilities or whether it's with your customers and your clients, believe me, everybody likes the positive attitude. Your clients love it. That's all part of customer service, right? Here's another one of my favorites in here. Anyone ever heard somebody talk about like, oh, this person has really good communication skills? You guys ever heard someone say that? I always kind of chuckle when I hear this because it's like, what does that mean? Like you realize at different universities you can major. Can you, is there a communications major at CSUN? Yeah. There's the whole freaking degree and topic on this. And yet people are like, oh, they're good at communication. What part of the communication, right? Are they responding timely? Are they articulate? Are they efficient? Are they verbose, right? Do they listen well? Do they speak well? Do they write well, right? Like all of these things are part of communication yet we always boil this down to just, don't, don't they have good communication skills, okay? One of them that I would uh, emphasize here and recommend is just keep people updated of the progress of jobs that you're working on, right? So, hey, Omar, I know you asked me to do this thing on Monday and you said it was due on, on Thursday. And instead of waiting until Wednesday night to say, Omar, I'm not gonna be able to get this to you today. It's gonna be Monday at the earliest. If on Tuesday I send Omar an email and say that early on, Omar's a lot happier with me than he is if I send him an email at 11.55 p.m. on Wednesday night just so I could say I got it to him before the day it was due that I'm going to need more time, right? Yeah, I always hate when that happens. It's a lot more helpful if people are more uh, upfront with the communication. Yep. And, and by the way, that helps a lot. We're like, hey, we are waiting on this to happen. I have an email and a phone call out to this person. They promised me that if they didn't call me back by uh, Wednesday night that I would reach out to them first thing Thursday morning. Didn't hear from a Wednesday night, so I'm following up with them Thursday morning, right? The simplest of things. One of the funny things to me now that we're part of Baker Tilly, we have people in multiple time zones. It's a simple communication issue when somebody says, let's meet at two o'clock. Pacific time, central time. That's why I started, and I actually started doing this a few years ago, but I'll always put PST, I'll always put EST or CST, Central Standard Time, right? Simple communication thing to let people know exactly what you mean. Keeping people updated of the status of a job too, is that's, that's one of the most important things in there, right? On the other end of communication, how many of you are the friend that when your friend has like a bunch of like, they just come to you and they unload? No. They just dump all of their problems at you and you are the listener. Your job in this friendship is to listen to them bitch and moan about everything and you do it fantastically. You are their best friend and you sit there and listen to them, get it all out, right? You take it all in. By the way, guys, that's a skill. How annoying is it to talk to someone who just, they're not listening to you. They're waiting for you to stop so that they can say what they're going to say. We all have friends like that, right? By the way, how many of you are the friends in the relationship where you're the one that dumps all of the information on them and you have a friend that listens very well? That's okay. I'm that person too. That's all right. I want you to at least recognize that your friend that is being that good listener, that's a wonderful skill to have. And I want you to be aware of that when you're in the workplace, that communication also encompasses this listening aspect. And depending upon who you're talking to, partner, manager, client, sometimes you're working with people who they themselves like to be the one dominating the airtime. And if you sit back instead of try to fight them for control of who talks when, it'll be better, right? And so I just want to point out that active listening is a big time skill that's super valuable. Okay. So that's it, guys. Here's our recap. We talked about prerequisite versus requisite, kind of laugh that, hey, these are both things that work before and during your jobs, right? We talked about problem solving, coming to the table with a solution, right? We talked about leadership, how important it is to lead by example, to, to be someone that makes other people better at what they do, whether that's early in your career or later. 
We talked about time management a little bit. We talked about self-reliance, when to do things yourself versus when to go for help. Customer service, right? Being involved with what our clients do, being timely and responsive. And we talked about communication skills. Does anyone have any questions about any of this stuff? I actually have a question um, tying those two together where, you know, they say they come to you for problem solving and yep. they're, they're always like, oh, I need this done by today. And let's just say you don't have that done by today. Do you immediately contact that person later that night to say, oh, I'll have it done tomorrow morning? Or I do would. you just do put an overwork to get that done by today? No, 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 no. I, I would for sure. Well, it depends, right? <laughs> like it depends just how like mission critical that is. <laughs> Sorry. Um, there have been times for me where I'm working on something and I'm like, I'm looking at it and going like, it's 11 o'clock at night and I have four more hours of work to do on this. And if I do it now, it's going to be sloppy. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm super tired. By the way, for the record, I'm a morning person. So for me staying up late, this is when mistakes happen. So sometimes, even though it's not, it's, they're not going to be happy about it. You email them and basically say, hey, look, I'm so sorry. This is going to take me a little bit longer to get it done. And I just want to make sure that I'm getting it right. Um, what, like, I'm going to wake up super early tomorrow. I'm going to try to have this done by 10 a.m. Is that okay? Or it's, hey, just to let you know, so you're not waiting for them to reply to you to say, no, that's not okay. Or yes, that's okay. You say, hey, listen, um, this is taking me a lot longer than I thought it was. I'm so sorry about that. This is a huge mistake by me. Um, I promise I will have it to you by 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. I know our deadline was tonight, but I'm not going to have it until 10 a.m. Now, I would suggest in that scenario, let's say your boss says it's, it's Tuesday night at 5 p.m. and they need this thing at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. And it's one of, let's say it's one of those things where like, it can't, it literally, it's an IRS filing. It literally has to be in or we're going to start paying penalties it's better to notify that person way earlier. Like instead of waiting until late that night to realize it early in the day at like one or 2 PM, just to be like, Hey, by the way, like I started working on this thing and it's taking me a lot longer than I thought that I don't think I'm going to be able to get it done by the deadline. Is it okay if I turn it in later? They'll let you know, like, absolutely not. That's unacceptable. This needs to be done right now versus like, Oh God. Okay. I don't want you staying up till three in the morning doing this. Um, that's okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it being a little late. Better to be upfront and honest about it so that you can get the feedback of, <clears throat> yeah, that's okay, or no, it's not. Uh, so, Garrett, I had a question. There's like, so on the CPA firm, sometimes uh, they give us some tasks and we don't know the deadline. So, but with our expectation, we can gotta think ask, that we can. You gotta ask for the deadline. You gotta, you gotta ask them to even make one up. It's like, hey, Oh, there's no deadline on this. It's like, okay, uh, it's Monday. It's uh, 1245. Um, can I get, if I get this to you at Wednesday by three o'clock, is that good? Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. That's too late. Okay, then, right? Like we're asking to figure it out. Okay. And I actually, sometimes I enjoy the open-ended ones because it's like, oh, how about Friday at, uh, at 5 p.m.? Or how about Monday at 10 a.m.? So I have the weekend to work on it. Yes, okay. yeah. That's how I try to use it. If I expect I can do it early, but I always tell them, okay, we'll be some later day to see how much they expect us to finish the job. That's how I try to do right now with my job is when they give me some tasks. Absolutely. Smart. All right, I have one question. So at workplace, like how we can make sure that our managers are like- I can tell them, okay, we can our efforts. I'm sorry, say that again? Like at workplace, like making sure that the managers and the partners, they see the efforts that we are putting for the job. Oh, the, that they see the efforts that you're doing? Yes. Um, well, this is changing, right? So one of the things about a remote work environment is no one can actually see you working. This is the old school notion and the old school mentality that physically being in the workplace, even if I'm watching baseball on ESPN all day, at least I'm physically in the office and people see me there, right? And I, I'm the first one in and I'm the last one out, right, Yanella? But, like, but I'm not actually working, right? So like 
to answer your question, do you want them to see the efforts that you're putting in? A lot of it has to start to be every time you say you're going to get something done by a certain time, you get it done by that time. Your emails become more timely. Your responsiveness, like when a partner or manager emails you something, you're responding to them in less than a minute or in less than two minutes. That lets, that's, there is a way virtually of letting people know, hey, I'm working really hard and I'm putting in a lot of effort right? The little green dot in Microsoft Teams or in Slack lets them know that you're, you're online working. Now, yes, you can set that to green even when you're sleeping, right? But there are things that you can do that, they, that let, you, let them know that you are actually working, right? Being really responsive, turning things in, asking, hey, I finished this up early. Can I have, is there any more work that I can help you out with? Yeah. yeah, you have to do things a little bit differently in the virtual format than you did like when you were in the office, because then they can physically see you in the office, right? In the virtual format, you've got to kind of like be more present remotely and virtually reaching out, letting them know that things are done or that you need more work because you're so great at what you do. You got it done early. Got it. Thank you, Garrett. Very good question. That's actually like I, I that's. This has been a COVID thing for sure, right? Partner can't see you working yeah. long hours, but you are. So am I still getting credit for it? Garrett, I have a question. Yes, Angel. Uh, so I was actually wondering, when you have a serious deadline, is it acceptable to be working during your lunch hour to make sure it gets done? Yeah, I mean, did, did he, not to be an asshole here, Angel, but this presentation is during the lunch hour, isn't it? That's right. I'm happy to do it. That's fine. I, I uh, right before we jumped on here, I grabbed myself some uh, some pita and hummus. So that that's it does happen. It's frustrating. Um, I the one thing I I do actually take seriously. And it's not just because my wife always brings this up. Um, how many of you legitimately get hangry? Like when you're hungry, you're like really mean to people. You're short, you're snappy, you're like moody. Like that's me. So I, I can, I can feel in my brain when I don't have enough like sugar going on or I don't have enough, like I'm hungry. It's like, okay, I got to eat. It's uh, not to get too graphic or offer too much detail, but like same thing. Like when you really need to go to the bathroom, how miserable is that? Some guy keeps talking, even though you really need to go to the bathroom. I can't focus. It's the only thing I can think of right now. But Angel, to answer your question, it happens sometimes. Like there definitely have been days where my breakfast or my lunch or something ended up being like a Nature's Valley bar that took me like less than 45 seconds to scarf down. Doesn't frequently happen, but every once in a while it does happen. Or there are days where I move my lunch later or I move it earlier based on what my schedule looks like that, those days. Thank you for uh, sharing. And I also think it's it's probably important to communicate with your manager when you're taking lunch. Oh yeah. As well. Hey, I'm gonna especially on a day where like every minute kind of is important. Like we have multiple things that we're trying to turn into the IRS to the October 15th deadline. Yeah, that's gonna be a day where it's like, hey, I'm stepping away from my desk for 10 minutes to go downstairs to get a sandwich from the cafe. I'll be right back. Um, don't freak out if you reach out to me and I'm not here. I'll be back. It's it's one, it's twelve forty six right now. I'm going to be back here at twelve fifty seven. Sounds ridiculous to a certain extent, but on pressure cooked days where you know that everyone is freaking out because there's a lot going on, that kind of communication is very much so appreciated. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing. I don't know. Sometimes too, I'll do stuff like uh, on days. Sometimes this is formally acknowledged. Some days, uh, at other times, I have a good enough relationship with my bosses. Like, let's say I did uh, Speech Sons Meet the Firms. Great event, but I was there until 10 p.m. at night. I don't live in the Valley. I live next to LAX, so I got to get my little Honda and drive all the way back down from the Odyssey all the way down to, to El Segundo. Right? And I didn't get to bed until 11, 11.30, and I'm a morning person. So the next day, maybe I work from home. Now, granted, in this environment, again, it's much more common for people to be working from home, but pre-COVID, right, post-COVID, um, hey, you know, I, we're, we're working really hard on a deadline today. You know that I'm burning it, the, you know, the candle at both ends. I'm going to be a zombie tomorrow. Is it okay if I take tomorrow off? Yep. 
right? So there are things you got to do to make sure your body and mind can handle these various deadlines, even when they start to be like really tough. You know what I mean, Angel? Yeah, I think I think I know what you mean. Although um, I actually wanted to ask you if it's accessible, acceptable to take short 10 minute breaks during like really long yeah. days. A hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. Like I encourage you, like get up, walk around, take a break, go walk outside, feel the sunlight. It's cool. It's great. Right. Like we have a really in our LA office here, which is, you can see behind me, that's the 405 behind me. Um, we've got like a really nice koi pond. It's really peaceful. I enjoy walking around it. So I have done this when I've gotten really upset over something or, or really stressed. I'll take a little break, take a three minute break. And, and, you know, if you guys has, if you guys have like a, a meditate function on your, your watches, right. If you have a smart watch or a, a phone, right. You know, 180 seconds, I'm just going to sit here and breathe and close my eyes. Absolutely. That's okay. Well, that's good to know. Thank you. I appreciate it. Look, we all, we all know, like when you're stressed and you're stretched, the quality of work you're doing goes down, right? So how many of us have ever been there where like you had a homework problem, you couldn't figure it out, you go to bed, you wake up the next morning and you solve it in two seconds because you're fresh and you're ready to go. Same stuff happens for us. We're like, I do that all the time. It's late at night, I'm working on something, I'm really tired and my boss, you know, there's an email sitting there and it requires a lot of nuance and energy to read through this. And I gotta be very careful what I say, cause this could be really angry or could be really, you know, like I gotta be careful. Probably not gonna answer that email at night. I'm gonna sleep on it. I'm gonna come back with my, you know, mug of coffee in the morning and I'm fresh after I've walked the dog. I'm gonna look at it again and then answer it. So there's all these little tips and tricks that you can do to kind of handle this stuff to give a better product than just rush crap out to the floor because you, you just wanna get something out there. Sometimes you do have that luxury. Sometimes you don't though. That's, that's one of the, the difficult things for sure. In the subject of emails late at night, yeah. what if you um, got an email late at night for a project that, or some, a deadline that suddenly came up and you're being asked, can you get it done um, by tomorrow morning? You know, the great thing about being a, a morning person is uh, I'm in bed. So if you email me at like 8.30 or 9 p.m., I'm in bed, sorry. I'm so sorry. I would have loved to have responded to your email. Didn't see it until five in the morning. Now, what? on the flip side of that, that does allow me a few hours in the morning to get stuff done before they're even awake. Um, but yeah, there, there are definitely some boundaries. Like I don't mind for me, like you guys can call, text, email me at any point during the day. If I, <laughs> Who was I just talking to who... who was making fun of me because I said that. I said, look, you can call, you can call, text, or email me at any point during the day. If I don't answer, it's because I'm doing something else. And my, my friend was like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> Obviously, if you don't answer, you're just doing something else. I was like, yeah, but that's my not so subtle way of saying like, there are times when I'm not going to answer you. But if I'm available, I will do my level best that if you email or call me or text me, I will answer. Right. And so there are boundaries like, yeah, if someone emails me something at like 1230 at night, number one, I'm probably sleeping. Number two, if I'm not sleeping because I'm watching Ted Lasso or something like that, like I'm going to look at it and go like, mm, I'll do this tomorrow. Very rarely in my career have I ever been emailed something so late at night that was a, a priority of the next day. Like we're not investment bankers. We're not lawyers. Okay. Like give me a little bit of a heads up on how much time you want me to do something. You don't pay me enough for me to wake up at 1230 at night to see your email, to answer it and do that for you. I may feel slightly differently for the investment bankers and lawyers who are making like 500 K a year at that point. Yeah. If one of your clients calls you at 1230 at night, you're getting up. And that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah. I, it rarely happens, Angel. It really, really like, most of the people, by the way, if someone does that, that's almost on them for having the like temerity or gall to ask you at 1230 at night to do something with a deadline of 9am the next morning. Like you've got to like, even though you know, it's an emergency, you've got to push back to your client sometimes saying like, uh, 
either you put that's you push back to the client and you say, hey, you asked too late, we can't get this to you by that deadline, or that's poor planning on your manager or partner's part. Like you gotta know, like, why didn't you know like 24 hours ago that this was gonna be due at this time? Again, I wouldn't recommend saying that to them. But like there are times where it's like, yeah, I'm sorry, I was asleep. I couldn't like I don't think it's unreasonable that I'm asleep at 1.30 in the morning. Yeah, I just want to add, it is sometimes intent from the client. They went to the manager, the manager to call them. So they tried to uh, ignore us or just give us some impossible deadlines. So we have to go, go to the higher up and tell them, okay, can you contact them and let them know that we cannot finish this on this time. That's how they want the, us to do because they don't want to call directly the manager. That's what I'm thinking. I think there's some times too where like you can set those expectations. Like early on in your job, if you're just like, hey, by the way, like I, do you expect me to answer the phone at midnight? They're like, oh yeah. Like I feel like that's almost like something that comes up, maybe not in an interview, but early on in it. Also Angel and, and Duck Twana, it, it depends. Like if I'm well aware that we're like, we're working on a job, the deadline is going to be a tight deadline and I'm expecting something super late to come in. Okay. Yeah. If I know it's coming and I'm, I'm looking for it and I'm expecting it. Okay. But like the random ones where it's like, yes, I, there's going to be times I'm not going to get to it. Sorry. That's all part of the relationships that you're building with both your bosses and your clients. I do enjoy requests where they're like, you know, clients like, hey, we need this by Friday. It's like, nope, not happening. <laughs> what you've asked for requires, you know, 40 hours of billable work. It's Thursday. You're not getting this tomorrow. Maybe if you had wanted this, you could have given this to me earlier in the week when you knew that this was the deadline. Again, not something I would recommend saying to a client. Thank you for sharing. That's a... Uh... A lot of helpful advice. I can tell you, Angel, too, like this doesn't like it doesn't too frequently come up. It's all the more reason that communication is important and you've got to do it early and often instead of everyone hates last minute stuff. Clients hate last minute stuff. Believe me, partners and managers hate last minute stuff. And and of course, we on the, the you know entry level end uh, hate last minute stuff. It's difficult for everyone. So it, it doesn't happen that often. Any other questions, guys? I think no, if no one don't have any questions. So right now is the picture tab. Everyone feel free to turn on your camera. We we'll just take some picture. Thank you everyone for coming. And once again, we have our announcements. Oh, thank you, especially to Gary for coming up. Um, on next Monday, we have the internship panel. On the 27th, we have the Anderson tax. And on 29th, we have the Halloween scavenger hunt. Thank you, everyone.